His current projects uh, explores the emergence of non-traditional family structures in South Korea. And I believe in his presentation today, he will share with us uh, findings from his current project. His talk will focus on uh, women's and men's uh, pathway to singlehood in South Korea. And without further ado, please let me invite Paul to share his research. And as a reminder, uh, please send in your questions in the chat box below. Okay, here you go, Paul. Um, great, thank you. Um, uh, so I'm grateful to Pook and to Director Jin Young for uh, allowing me to share ongoing research. I'm also thankful to Zhu for coordinating this event and to all of you for being here today. Uh, this is a paper I'm writing with Chie O, oh, who recently graduated from the PhD sociology program at Yonsei University, uh, and also with Young Mi Kim, who is on faculty uh, in sociology at Yonsei. And uh, as Puk mentioned, I'm especially grateful to be with you even virtually because my first job out of graduate school was in Singapore. And although I'm much older now, I still remember the anxieties of the job market as a graduate student. So I'll be forever thankful to Singapore for uh, giving me my first chance. Um, I'm also thankful because we're now revising this paper and working on a new framework. Uh, so it would really help us to get uh, any feedback you can uh, provide. So uh, I'm guessing a lot of this is gonna resonate with you and uh, hopefully, uh, or maybe some of it won't be so surprising because Singapore and South Korea are very similar on many accounts. Uh, so you'll probably already know uh, that marriage trends are changing in many parts of the world. In South Korea, like other countries, these trends are reflected in the rising age of first marriage, which is now over 30 years old for both women and men. Um, and in addition to delayed marriage, there's the possibility that Koreans are foregoing marriage altogether. Uh, although this graph does reflect the increasing age of marriage, we can see that there is a growing proportion uh, of people in their 40s who remain unmarried. According to this data, 17% who are between 40 and 44, and 10% of those who are between 45 and 49 years old are not yet married. And this is significant because the chances of marriage after 50 years old is low, and it's likely that many of these people uh, will not remarry for the remainder of their lives. Um, and we also know that marriage is particularly important for other dimensions of the demographic, quote unquote, demographic revolution in East Asia, where marriage and fertility are closely coupled. Here we see that compared to Italy, for example, uh, there's relatively a small proportion of children born outside of marriage, both for uh, Japan and South Korea. And as you all know, the total fertility rate has been dropping in South Korea and its neighbors. Uh, to put this into context, Korea currently actually has the lowest fertility rate in the world. In 2020, this data just came out last week, actually, South Korea recorded a 0.84 total fertility rate, which is quite remarkable. And the third year in a row where the TFR uh, has been below one. It's, it was 0.92 in 2019 and 0.98 in 2018. And we think this may be the lowest fertility rate recorded for countries that are not in the middle of a war, uh, but we're still checking on that. Um, and also November 2019 was the first time that South Korea recorded more deaths than births. Mm. And 2020 will go down in history as the first year where the population began to decline. So we're definitely in an important historical juncture. Um, and changing marriage trends are also uh, influencing shifts in household structure. Here we can see a rather dramatic rise in the proportion of households that are occupied by a single person. That's this uh, dark blue at the bottom. You can see in 1960 is quite low, but by 2015, that jumps to 26%. And in fact, today, the most recent data, it shows that maybe between 30 and 35% of all households are made up of a single person, which is now, I believe, the modal category. Um, so when we turn to the existing literature explaining marriage behavior, it's immediately clear that unlike the straightforward finding for men, where higher SES is consistently positively related to men's marriage chances, the really interesting debate has been about the impact of women's expanding educational and economic opportunities on marriage. The original conclusion was that women's higher SES is negatively related to marriage. This was captured in Becker's famous independence hypothesis, uh, where high SES women are able to quote unquote buy out of marriage because of the restrictive and patriarchal nature of the marriage institution. Uh, and that argument became conventional wisdom of sorts until more recent American data showed that higher SES women may delay marriage, but actually end up marrying at higher rates than their lower SES counterparts. This revision is captured in Sweeney's 2002 article uh, that builds on Oppenheimer's earlier work, where she argued that the economic foundations of marriage has indeed shifted. 
Uh, and importantly now, uh, this is the main point, this is the main narrative coming out of America, is that there is symmetry in the determinants of marriage for both men and women. That is to say the same variables in the same direction accounts for their marriage chances. Um, so a little bit simplistic, that was a little bit simplistic, but that is in essence the state of the literature for studies of marriage in the United States and significant parts of Europe. There are, however, three important interventions in this literature that attempt to clarify the scope conditions or generalizability of the shifting economic foundations argument. Uh, they're not necessarily in dialogue with each other, and one of the goals of our paper is to bring these literatures uh, together. So first, building on Blasfeld's 1995 comparative study of societies defined by different gender specialization regimes, Ono, in a 2003 article, uh, forwarded the quote-unquote contextual variation hypothesis, where she argued that the relationship between women's SES and marriage is mediated by norms surrounding gender equality in cultural contexts, such as America and Western and Northern Europe, egalitarian norms can support women's ability to pursue both professional careers and families, and that's reflected in the positive relationship between SCS and marriage outcomes. In societies where traditional gender specialization is strong, however, women may indeed be motivated to continue to quote unquote buy out of marriage, resulting in a negative relationship between SCS and women's marriage outcomes. This of course is the basis for um, McDonald's gender equity theory explaining low fertility also. So our paper builds on this effort to continue defining the scope conditions for the theories of marriage trends that specifically identify and clarify the importance of local context and cultures. Uh, second, and I probably don't have to convince this audience, uh, but a unique aspect of East Asian societies is the prevalence of quote unquote strong familyism. As you all know, in East Asia, extended family members, especially grandparents, are important members who exert significant influence on family behavior. And strong familyism is reflected in things like an exaggerated sense of responsibility parents have about their children's future, uh, greater interactions between family members, collective decision-making, which may really be a euphemism for greater parental control uh, of children's lives. And finally, norms surrounding, quote, filial responsibility to take care of el elderly parents. And although we hesitate to point to Confucian values or Confucian societies, mostly because Confucianism is so broadly defined and applied in addition to the possibility of essentializing Asian cultures, uh, but still most would probably agree that the norms surrounding taking care of elderly parents are significantly different in East Asia compared to Western societies. And third, we draw on the recent push to consider not only traditional measures of SES, but also accumulated wealth. Specifically applied to marriage outcomes, Dan Schneider in the 2011 paper showed that individual wealth contributed to the possibility of marriage. That study, however, only looked at personal wealth, but another line in this burgeoning literature is the role of parental wealth in the continuation and indeed the exacerbation of intergenerational inequality. Uh, and finally, and I'm a bit embarrassed to confess, but I just found this article this morning about how extended family wealth affects an individual's ability to purchase a home. We'll see in the data later that this is one of our central themes that we wanna highlight in our own paper. So again, our hope is to provide additional clarity about the scope conditions necessary when adjudicating the dominant arguments about marriage behavior by bringing together these three interventions in the literature that have not yet been discussed in unison. Um, the basic question we ask is what issues, challenges shape marriage behavior? We wanna explore whether these determinants vary by sex. And in particular, we wanna identify other dimensions of quote unquote, the cultural context that have been understudied. And a central motivation for the study is to provide additional clarity about local mechanisms. Of course, you know, many have looked at how SCS matters, but how does SCS manifest specifically in Korean society? And all, also others have included family background variables in their analyses, including parental SCS, but these are mostly relegated to a general set of resources without articulating how specifically they may affect marriage decisions. So we draw on a mixed method strategy to answer these questions. The study is based on a set of interviews I conducted for a larger project on Korean families uh, for a book I'm trying to write about non-normative families in Korea. Uh, and the interview samples in this uh, group is limited to never married individuals who are between 35 and 50 years old. Uh, and the relatively older age threshold uh, was because we wanted to talk to people who are past the average age of marriage in Korea. The basic questions, guiding those interviews were why haven't you married and what are the central issues that discourage you from marrying? 
Uh, and then to see whether the themes and patterns we identify in the qualitative data are widely applicable, we also analyze the CLIP survey, which is a popular panel data set. Uh, we limit our analytical sample to more than 7,000 unmarried individuals who are at least 18 years old in the first wave and unmarried in 1998 and follow them to 2017. And that's the last year uh, the data were publicly available. The essential question in this analysis is what are the individual level attributes that influence transition to first marriage? Uh, and we adopt a modeling strategy that many of you are probably familiar with. Um, I heard there's a lot of demographers in the room. Uh, I just wanna point out here the fact that following the lead of Cecilia Fukuda's 2013 article, uh, we use the complementary log log link when estimating discrete time hazard models. And the C log log link, according to Singer and Willett, produces hazard rates, uh, or it produces hazard rates rather than odds ratios. And according to Singer and Willett, quote unquote, yields a direct analog to the continuous time hazard model. Uh, so it's a little bit easier to interpret, uh, and that's helpful too. Uh, and finally, we present a couple of uh, Kaplan-Meier survival estimates or curves to visualize some of our findings. Um, we pursue what Mario Small has called, uh, quote, mixed data analysis, where the analyses of qualitative and quantitative data inform each other. Uh, we do that by first coding interview transcripts deductively based on dominant themes in the literature, but also paying close attention to emerging themes not included in the code book. Uh, we use the findings from the qualitative analysis to identify more specific variables included in the quantitative models, especially uh, we're keen on identifying the variables that have been not that have not been included in past quantitative studies of marriage. Uh, we then draw on interviews again when we interpret the results from the quantitative analysis. So we go back to interviews to help us understand the quantitative results as well. So there's a constant back and forth between, uh, it's not really shown in this presentation today, but in the paper, there's much more back and forth. Um, so when we look at the interview transcripts, a dominant theme was the insistence that forming and maintaining families in Korea is too costly, uh, probably a theme that resonates in Singapore as well. Uh, there was also the belief that Korea's marriage culture is explicitly gendered. As this 41-year-old female book editor notes, quote, marriage culture clearly defines the roles for men and women. From the man's point of view, marriage is too burdensome, and from a woman's point of view, it is also too burdensome. However, it became quickly clear that men and women identified distinct challenges that limit their ability to marry. So that is say different challenges. Um, for men, not surprisingly, uh, the single dominant issue to emerge was the financial burden of taking care of a family. And although we have tons of data to corroborate this, I only share this one quote because it actually talks about the actual amount of money men think they need to uh, survive in Korean society and to find potential partners. Uh, this is from a 37-year-old male researcher who says, uh, there are many things I'm lacking. My job, my social position are vague. I guess the financial consideration is the biggest thing. In the case of women, some want a man with a lot of money or someone who's really good looking. In the case of men, they make about 2 million Korean won, which is roughly $2,000, which I believe is almost 2,000 Sing dollars. Or if I remember correctly, it's been a long time since I did the conversion, uh, but they're able to live in Korea with that. But it's a large burden, burden if they marry their girlfriend and try to take care of their wife and child because women are reluctant. There are a lot of men who can't find a spouse. In the case of women, they want three to four million uh, Korean won or roughly three to 4,000 US dollars. And if you've been to South Korea and Seoul and also Singapore for that matter, you'll know that even three to $4,000 is probably uh, pretty hard to raise a family in these um, really expensive um, places. Um, while the emphasis on financial burden is not surprising, one thing that did stand out in the interviews was the consistent referencing of parental support. Several of the male interviews pointed to the need to buy a marital home upon marriage. The marriage culture in Korea assumes that men will provide a home when they marry and that women will furnish the home. Um, so male and female interviews both noted this large responsibility for men. But our interviewees also noted that it's impossible for men to purchase a marital home without help from their parents. As this 35 year old male designer explains, as I said before, uh, even if I have money, even if my parents would have money and I'm unable to receive support from them, then I can't marry because it's difficult to purchase a house with only the money that I make. And conversely, even if my salary is low or salary is low, parents who have money will provide a house for their child. Well, the best, if, best is if you have both things. The guys who are unmarried into late age are the ones who are unable to marry, not because they chose not to marry. No matter what, the biggest hurdle to marrying is the cost of housing. 
I can't ask someone to marry me if I don't even have a house to live in. My monthly salary is not really small, but I wonder if I'll be able to afford a house and sell before I die. I realize it's probably not going to happen, but at the very minimum, you have to be able to prepare a home to live, uh, to live in, to have a family. So the emphasis on the marital home and the role of parental wealth in supporting a home purchase is potentially important because it identifies a unique mechanism by which parental quote unquote background variables matter. Uh, and we explore this possibility in the quantitative models. Also, probably not surprisingly, uh, a dominant theme to emerge from the female interviews were the anxiety surrounding employment after marriage. As Mary Brinton and Unshir Oh showed in the recent AJS article, the M curve, where women exit the labor force in their 30s and attempt to re-enter in their 40s is even more pronounced in South Korea than it is in Japan. And I'm not sure what it is for Singapore or if there is an M curve. Uh, these trepid trepidations were expressed by a 44-year-old female Christian pastor who said, I would like to continue to be employed. I want to be employed for the rest of my life. There are lots of men who want women to only support them. That is why shortly after marriage, uh, there are lots of cases of women stepping down from work. Seeing that, I realized there won't be a chance to maintain my employment after marriage. Men put limitations, tehan, on women when they marry. And if I were to be tied to the institution of marriage, I would lose what's mine. I will lose my employment and will likely have to give up what's mine. Um, in addition to the challenges of securing both work and family, female interviewers consistently referred to quote unquote in-law culture as a factor that significantly diminishes their motivations to marry. As a 36 year old waitress notes, it's always the case that marriage is not only about marrying the man, I have to be together with the members of this family as well. A 42-year-old female designer also confesses that I don't think I could handle our country's in-law culture, shidekuna. Uh, and finally, a 37-year-old female staff at a school shares, I don't, I think it's impossible, I think it's possible I won't marry. If I marry, then I have to visit both sides, his and her family. We can't travel during Korean holidays. There's a lot of uncomfortable things. I think it might be good to have a spouse. I think having just a spouse would be good, but not so much the in-law families. Um, so incidentally, there is a Korean drama that I believe is just wrapping up now, a recent drama titled Daughter-in-Law that exposes the challenges of women uh, who marry into uh, their husband's families. The fact that the drama is hugely popular today may reflect the continuing salience and relevance of the traditional in-law culture. Surely these issues still resonate in Korean uh, society today. So we now turn to our quantitative analysis to assess whether the themes we identified in the interview data are widely applicable, at least in a representative sample of Koreans. Our dependent variable is time to marriage, and we include the usual source of covariates, uh, including age, age squared, cohort comparing the millennial generation to earlier cohorts, residence in Seoul, and different SES variables, including income, employment, education, in addition to whether individuals were enrolled in school at the time of the survey. Uh, the variables uh, that we are particularly interested in based on the analysis of the qualitative interview data are parental assets, including home ownership and only child. Now, if procuring a marital home is necessary for men and parents have to contribute to this, then parental assets may be important for men, but not necessarily for women. Uh, we created a parental assets variable by combining various resources, including cash in the bank, value of any investment holdings, such as stocks, bonds, trusts, excuse me, insurance policies, expected payouts from informal financing, interpersonal loans. Uh, from that, we created an ordinal, ordinal categorical variable defining parents worth less than $10,000, between 10 and $40,000, and more than $40,000. Uh, and we also included parental home ownership separately. Uh, unfortunately, the survey didn't ask respondents whether they planned on co-residing with their elderly parents, or if they expect to be the primary caretaker of their parents in late age. And the survey also didn't ask the level of engagement, such as um, how much time they hope to spend with their parents. Uh, these would all be better operationalizations of filial duties or expectations. But in a different paper, we found that Korean men who are the only child were not considered popular in the international marriage market with women from China and Southeast Asia, expressing the fear about how marrying men without siblings would increase their interactions with their husband's parents. That is to say the burden of taking care of their in-laws. So although not a strong measure of filial responsibility, we include a marker of whether a respondent is the only child in the family based on the assumption that the burden for taking care of elderly parents is greater if it's unable to be shared with siblings. Uh, there is an interesting 2017 paper in ASR by Angelina Grigoreva, 
uh, that shows how siblings negotiate with each other about caring for their parents. Of course, only children are unable to negotiate help from siblings because they don't have any. Uh, and so finally, uh, we won't really get into it today, but we were interested in whether the impact of certain SCS variables on transitions in marriage changed between cohorts. So moving on to uh, the results. Uh, first, we can see that predictably greater income increases the chances of marriage for men. Uh, interestingly, however, uh, income is also positively related to women's marriage chances. When we, but when we look at other SES variables, gender patterns emerge, uh, stark gender patterns emerge. Employment is positively related to men's marriage chances, but doesn't seem to affect women's marriage outcomes. Education, on the other hand, shows the clear opposite trend with higher educated men marrying more than their lower educated counterparts. But for women, education is negatively related to marriage with graduates of tertiary education institutions marrying at lower rates than women with high school or less education. And these results are consistent with the independence argument where the resilience of traditional specialization norms motivate high SES women to avoid marriage. Uh, although the model coefficients can't speak to this possibility, our interviews do shed some light. So for example, um, this 35 year old female interviewee says, now education level and everything else is the same for women. We studied this much. Do we really have to give that up just to have children and get married? This next quote by a 37 year old waitress is particularly interesting because she learns of the value of women's education from her mother. Although planning for divorce rather than first marriage, she notes that that is why if a woman does not study, is educated, that I'm not sure what kind of life she'll live. That is why no matter what, uh, my mom pushed me to study. For example, she would say, if a woman marries and the man is not so good, then the woman needs skills to make money to divorce and to leave the marriage. She would say, she would say things like that. Uh, if you're going to be able to do that, then you need to study because you're a woman. You will study and no matter what happens, you'll be able to hold on. So I studied hard because there was so much prodding um, in the house. When we turn to the parental assets variable, we also see an interesting disparity between men and women. Men who have parents worth between ten dollars to $40,000 and greater than $40,000 are more likely to marry than men with less affluent parents. The story for women, however, is a bit more complicated. While women with parents worth between ten dollars and $40,000 do marry more than the reference group parents with under $10,000, women with the richest parents don't have a greater chance of marrying. That is to say, some moderate level of parental resources help, but women do not need parents with a ton of resources. Now, incidentally, uh, a different survey about marriage intentions and housing showed that a great majority of Korean women over 80% say they're willing to partially contribute to the cost of the marital home. But when asked about the specific amounts they intend to contribute, the modal answer was less than 50 million Korean won or less than roughly $50,000. We were excited to find this additional survey because then I think our findings make some sense. Women need some moderate level of resources, again, usually from the parents, to marry, but compared to men, they don't need a whole lot, relatively, and certainly not enough to purchase a home in Korea. So it makes sense to us that women with parents worth between 10 and $40,000 have a marriage advantage, but that greater parental resources are not significant. Uh, and we can visualize the differential impact of parental assets on men's and women's marriage chances here with these Kaplan-Meier survival curves. Uh, unlike women, men whose parents are in the lowest asset category here uh, are significantly likely to uh, not only delay marriage, which is shown by the gap, that is to say, this is age down here, transitioning to marriage, uh, not only delay marriage, but also maybe not marry at all. At 49 years of age, the CLIPS data show that about 40% of men with poorer parents remain unmarried, which is pretty remarkable. You can see that for women, it's different. Um, women who have lower, um, uh, less affluent parents do marry later uh, than uh, women uh, who have richer parents, but ultimately they end up catching up in terms of the overall marriage rates. And finally, uh, the results show that individuals without siblings are significantly less likely to transition into marriage. And this is true for both uh, men and women. So to conclude, uh, it's clear that marriage and family constitute um, significant burdens for Korean young adults who are navigating today's precarious economy. Uh, these challenges manifest differently for men and women. In addition to confirming Ono's contextual variation hypothesis, with Korean women struggling to secure both work and family, our results illuminate specific mechanisms that may be construed as effects of strong familyism. One interesting thing to note is the possible difference between Korea and Japan. Satsuya Fukuda, 
uh, showed in his really interesting 2013 article that high earning Japanese women were more likely to marry. Uh, we also found that income positively affects Korean women's chances, but the results for education leads us to emphasize the gender equity story rather than the shifting economic foundations argument. It's worth mentioning that Mary Brinson and Hong Jun Lee noted in their 2016 paper that Korea does indeed have the most conservative gender role ideology. Uh, and we also hope that the study illustrates the efficacy of bringing together disparate literatures to understand marriage patterns. We expand the contextual variation hypothesis by including different cultural norms, in this case, strong familyism or one version of it. Uh, we also combine the literature on personal wealth on marriage with the um, literature on intergenerational wealth and inequality. And then we extend the extended family and home ownership literature by seeing how they're related in the context of marriage culture. Uh, and finally, um, I wanted to ask all of you what you thought about the only child variable. Uh, the goal was to try our, our best attempt to tightly couple the qualitative and the quantitative analyses. Um, and we feel pretty good about the parental assets variable reflecting the burdens of buying a marital home that our male interviewees brought up. Uh, but we want to check with you whether the fear of quote unquote in-law responsibility that emerged from the interviews can be captured by or even related to the only child variable. Again, our reasoning uh, that we try to write out was that filial burdens are greater if you have to go at it alone. Uh, of course, there are other possible reasons why only child or only children have lower uh, marriage chances, including they themselves might be discouraged to marry because they don't want the additional burden of uh, starting their own families because they have to take care of their own parents. Uh, for women, they might want to take care of their own parents rather than take care of their husband's parents. Uh, and this is a little bit controversial, but psychologists have pointed to the quote unquote only child syndrome reflecting the relative difficulty only children face when forming social relationships. Uh, so we're trying to think through all of this and any help from all of you uh, would be greatly appreciated. And of course, we're interested in what you think about the strong familyism framework. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Paul. Wow, you actually got it done in 30 minutes. So we yeah. have plenty of time still for discussion and question, of course. Um, so let me see if anyone have questions. You can either, you know, raise your hand or put in your in the chat box saying that you want to ask question. And then I will give the floor to you. Anyone, any taker? So if not, I guess I start and I'm sure people will, uh, will join me later. Oh, I saw one raised hand. Okay, uh, let me uh, get uh, Pauline Tan to ask first then. Pauline, do you want to raise questions? You're muted. Hi, Prof Chang. Um, I was, I was um, um, wondering about um, the coefficient for education for women and wondering whether that reflects um, to some extent um, also a asymmetry in the way that people think about women's education. So on the one hand, um, it correlates with income. Uh, and on the other hand, could it be possible that in fact, um, highly educated women are not as attractive? Um, you know, it, that is to say that it's also a level of asymmetry when it comes to um, education, uh, how, how, you know, they're perceived in the dating market. Um, I also have a comment uh, with regard to your final question about uh, only children. So you mentioned that as um, um, it, it may be a proxy for parental burden. And I, I was just wondering, what about the, um, the view of parents as a kind of support um, on top of, you know, instead of obligation, they could also be a source of support. Um, I, I, I don't know whether this is common in Korea because I'm not Korean, but um, I think in Singapore, I've often heard of people actually asking their parents to continue to do their laundry, uh, cook for them, um, even when they're in their early 30s or 20s because they are busy working. Uh, so those are kind of my, my, my um, thoughts. Thank you. Uh, great, thank you. Um, do you want me to answer each question as they come yeah, out? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I think we okay. have time. Okay, so um, thank you for the questions. Um, those are things that uh, we've been thinking about and struggling with as well. So the fact that you're pointing them out, I think 
uh, says a lot about the kinds of themes that are emerging from this uh, discussion. Um, so one quick clarification, um, it's not necessarily true in Korean society that high education is correlated with income uh, for two reasons. One, education levels are so high, it's almost, it's not universal, but it's over 70% um, for women. So, you know, there's a lot of people being educated and people talk about really the fine grain is really what school you go to as opposed to college degree, because college degree doesn't mean that much when the great majority of the population is graduating from college. Um, and two, there is some data that shows the actually highest educated women, um, not so much in graduate degrees, but the highly more affluent schools like the Sky School, Seoul National, Yonsei, and Korea universities are actually not working as much because they usually tend to marry quote unquote well and their husbands make money and they tend to marry into more traditional families. So it's possible that they're not actually using their education. One of the unique things about Korean society is that they, they have one of the, and this is something that Mary Brinson and Shiro uh, talk about, but they have one of the highest uh, tertiary um, matriculation rates, but one of the lowest, at least in the OECD, uh, female labor force participation rates. So, the, so they're not taking advantage of their education. So that there's a disjuncture there. Uh, two, um, we framed high educated women as, so we put the, so the, it depends on where you put the agency. For highly educated women, the way that the story that we're trying to sell is that they're choosing to buy out of marriage because they want to continue working. That's what our interviewees um, told us. There was in the interviewees though, the, uh, the thread of basically men either being afraid of women that are so highly educated. Um, and also this is gonna be so horrible, but in the most popular dating, um, site, and maybe Tian Li might be able to chime in here, but in the most popular dating site in Korea, I heard that you put all your information in your education, your status, your job, your height, your weight, what your parents do. And they kind of create a computational score for how popular you are. And it turns out, obviously, for men, high education is positive, but for women, apparently, if you have a PhD, you're kind of low on that rank. And I've talked to several of my friends, female friends who, in graduate school, when we're in grad school, and my Korean female friends in graduate school, and they would always complain that because they're in the PhD program, they're so unpopular on the marriage market. So there is some evidence, at least anecdotal evidence, of that. Um, in this paper, though, we're trying to sell the other story, the agency of the woman as opposed to the agency of the men. Um, but it's not to say they're mutually exclusive. So that is a possibility there as well. And finally, the parental obligation. Um, I, uh, we were hoping to try to uh, frame or sell not a, um, a skewed version of parental. It's not so much parental response uh, or you're responsible for taking care of the parents. The fact that you need parental resources to purchase a home for the men is really about the parental responsibility for their children's uh, life and social success. As uh, people reach, uh, as people transition, the marker, the, the sort of the normal trend, um, uh, markers of adult transition, graduate college, get a job, move out of your parents' home, get married and have children. Those are like the five markers of, of transition to adulthood. Marriage really requires parental resources. Actually, you're, you need your parental resources for all of that almost. Uh, so on the men's side, it's really about parental responsibilities to the child. On the woman's side, it was, a, it was flipped and it was kind of like women feeling their responsibility to take care of the parents. So we were trying to show that they're working, but it was gendered. Um, and my guess is to your example, and this is kind of a, you know, it's just a sort of an anecdotal and a kind of a quippy example, but my guess is that, you know, these parents are doing the laundry for the sons, not for the daughter. You know what I mean? So, so we think about like, what, I mean, like there's that saying where Korean men just never learn because the parents, their mom does the cooking and laundry. And then when they get married, their wife does it. And so they never have to basically. Right. And so, you know, the parental support, it's gendered. And so we were trying to show that. Uh, and for men, they need parental support for women. They're afraid of taking care of their parents. Okay. Uh, Senhu. Hi, Paul. Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so my uh, actually, uh, so my first question is about the contribution of, uh, of contribution of this paper because uh, you mentioned that so this paper combines many different perspectives and you mentioned and and, uh, and I think there are also very a lot of interesting findings such as parental asset uh, responsibility for for women. You also mentioned work life balance. So. 
Uh, so I just uh, didn't understand very clearly then what would be your contribution and how uh, how and uh, how can you incorporate all these different perspective to make your contribution. Yes, yeah, so, uh, yeah. So this is the first question. Uh, and uh, and in terms of the second qu uh, question is about the uh, is about the statistical uh, analysis. And uh, you mentioned that you use the discrete hazard model. So if I understand correctly, so this is uh, essentially a logistic multi-level models. And uh, yeah, and if so, I just want to ask to what extent can this model make causal inference and can you make some, com uh, yeah, so just, uh, can you make some comments in terms of causality of this, uh, yeah, of this analysis? Okay. Uh, great. Thank you for those questions. Um, so the contribution is the most important question we're struggling now because we're trying to reframe the paper in such a way that clarifies the contributions. And that's, yeah. that's, so we're trying to rewrite the first half of the paper essentially is what we're doing. Okay, yeah, yeah. This, the, the framework that I, I tried on you guys today, clearly not so clear <laughs> because you're asking that question. Like, but the, the, the framework we're trying to sell and, I'm, and, and I really want to know what you think about it, whether it's actually convincing or not, is the state of the literature now is basically Sweeney's argument, the, the changing economic foundations of marriage. And the argument there is that men's and women's marriage, determinants of marriage for men and women have now become the same. In the past, uh, it was opposite. It was in the independence hypothesis, but now this is the current state of the literature. Obviously, it's got a Western bias, right? So... There's a few paper like Ono's paper that came out and Boswell's stuff and people who think comparatively, but the dominant literature is still that. And the thing is that the, and what we're trying to say is like one, different cultural context matters. And in the different cultural context, the one thing that Ono recognized was the culture of gender egalitarianism. That was the one thing she pointed out. What we're trying to do is, yeah, that matters, but there's also a bunch of other cultural factors, including in this case, strong familyism. So it's kind of a it's kind of a it's kind of a stab at the Megan Sweeney literature, which I still think. Chang Chi, I know you work on this stuff too, so maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong. But I feel like that's still the dominant state of the literature in, in West, at least in English print today. And so we're still taking, and people are taking stabs at it. And then so. We're taking a stab at it by expanding, again, the contextual variation hypothesis to include different cultural uh, elements. And then we're trying to bring in this wealth literature, which hasn't been tied to marriage yet, except for uh, individual wealth, and that's Dan Schneider. So he's the only one that really talks about wealth and marriage, but he's only taking, talking about the individual level. But when you think about wealth, the really dominant story is about intergenerational inequality, but they're not talking about marriage. They're only talking about intergenerational, the recreation of inequality across generations. So we're trying to say, well, there's all this other stuff. We, if you combine that with Dan Schneider's point, then it's really parental wealth on marriage. And that's actually tied into the contextual variation hypothesis because that's one aspect of the East Asian culture that matters for marriage and thus taking a, a stab at the Sweeney argument. That's what we're trying to sell. And I don't know if that's convincing, but you, know, you can let me know, uh, but that's what we're trying. Um, okay. Your second question, really quickly, the causal model. So it's just a survival model, which is, um, you know, like zero, 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 and then one, they get married and then they exit, you know what I mean? And the only thing you can't really, like, it's not a formal causal model. I mean, I'm in the department with Chris Winship, who, you know, wrote the book on causal inference, <laughs> literally wrote the book on it. And so, you know, he's always pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And it's not a formal causal inference model like that. But you do the same kinds of tricks that a lot of demographers use when they use survival models. You lag the uh, um, time um, uh, variant uh, variables. Yeah. Uh, you lag it, you know, so it's like T minus one. And then, you know, you look at the dependent variable the following year. So you do kind of things like that, but it's not a formal causal model by any means. Um, yeah. Thank you you just can't do that with a survival um, model or with this particular panel survey data. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so there's two hands, uh, Jean and Chen Chen. So I guess, you know, I will take questions from both of you and then have Paul answer all at once. Jean, please. Uh, okay. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I'm intrigued about the, the qualitative uh, analysis you have done. Actually, mixed uh, method analysis is great. And 
we know how difficult it is to put them together. Um, Sharongu is here. Maybe you want to show your face sometime. <laughs> we have worked on some uh, mixed method analysis before and uh, know how difficult it is to put them together. So I would actually uh, like to know a little more um, insight that you have gained from the qualitative um, interview about this. And, uh, you know, something that's difficult for us to know from the quantitative analysis, uh, such as the in-law culture, or, or more specifically, mother-in-law culture in, um, in Korea, which is, uh, as I heard, quite, quite uh, intimidating for at least mo most of the women, uh, Korean women that I am familiar with. Um, so, and, and how you put uh, qualitative data uh, analysis with quantitative data? Maybe uh, you, we, you know, I, I would be interested in reading how you put them together. Um, but that's 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 about that. Uh, what I want to say also is about your quantitative data. Uh, I think uh, what you have found about uh, you know different impact of education for men and women. Uh, and also, you know, higher education uh, is a disadvantage to women and uh, parental wealth uh, is uh, more disadvantage for men uh, to, to, for their propensity of getting married. Those are in general, uh, very consistent with uh, finding uh, that we have found in China at least and, and probably in, in Taiwan as well. So uh, I'm glad that you uh, confirm those kind of uh, patterns. Uh, I'm really glad that you mentioned Fukuta's uh, 2013 paper. Actually, that paper was presented and published uh, in one of our special issues that we edited oh, cool. uh, in the conference that I organized. And I was mm -hmm. really um, excited when he presented the data, you know, back in 2013. That was the first time in Asia that we have actually found a positive relationship between um, education and propensity of getting married for women. And so I keep, since then, uh, it's been seven years, eight years, uh, I keep looking for that relationship in other countries. China, I haven't found it. Uh, uh, Korea, we haven't seen it either. And, and you confirmed that today too, but that is a very important uh, uh, pattern. And I think we should keep, uh, you know, looking out for, for whether things are um, making a turn uh, for mm -hmm. patterns like that. Uh, I want to say that, uh, you know, the two other more macro contexts that uh, I wonder you if you have taken into consideration. One is the labor market uh, yeah, situation. Uh, and the other one is the marriage market situation and how that have affected the um, uh, marriage behavior in, in South Korea. Um, you know, Fakuta's paper, actually one of the reasons why uh, that, that he, he mentioned was because of the declining economic uh, well-being or the wages yeah. for men. Yeah. Uh, because of the, uh, you know, various financial markets crisis uh, since 1997, uh, um, yeah, 1997 and other financial crises. So it's, it's, a, it's consistent with United States situation when we start to see um, men's economic situation start to decline and women's mm -hmm. is getting better because of the service economy uh, and also more recently, the IT economy is uh, is booming, and uh, that seems to uh, you know benefit women uh, a little bit more than men. So that's something I thought maybe you can think about in a Korean context. And the other one is a marriage market. Is that uh, I'm sure, uh, as in other Asian countries, Korean women still wants to marry up. You know, so they're looking for uh, men that have higher education than they do. But as you know, uh, Korean women's higher education 
uh, college enrollment rate is more than 100% these days. And so, uh, and it's higher than the, the men's education. So in terms of the match of a suitable partner on the marriage market that is working very much toward the disadvantage of women. So I thought this, um, you know, the more macro, I, I know, I understand you want to look at the uh, individual agency issues more and, and the cultural context more in this paper, but I, I think this bigger context of, uh, you know, how labor market and marriage market has been affecting how men and women think about whether or not they want to get married. And, and in many cases, it may not be a choice. It may be a, a constraint. Uh, if you ask most young people, they're still telling you that they want to get married. <laughs> mm -hmm. They would ideal as, aspire to get married, mm -hmm. uh, but they cannot find a suitable um, you know, partner. So, so those are just a few comments that came to mind. Thank you. Do you want to respond? Oh, do you want to respond now? Um, because Jean uh, had sure. several points to make. Uh, sure. Okay. Um, um, so, uh, just a quick confession: the interviews were uh, conducted for the on the qualitative interviews were conducted not for this paper specifically. It was they were conducted as part of a larger project on Korean families. So um, uh, we have four case studies, single mothers, people who don't marry, uh, senior citizens and multicultural families. So foreign brides, so marriage brides. So that's my four cases for the book. And we asked a bunch of other stuff in interviews and marriage was a part of it, was a big part of it obviously because it's really about never married singles. Um, and there was a lot more in the interviews than showed up in the paper or definitely in the presentation, but also in the paper. Um, for example, one of the things that women talk a lot about was the workplace environment, the culture, the, you know, the glass ceiling, et cetera, things like that, which is kind of speaks to your earlier point about the labor market and the conditions of the larger macro labor market and how that's affecting um, um, people's thinking about marriage, or women's thinking about marriage. Um, in terms of the the, the, the quantitative, um, so this is something that's really, I think, this is something I've been struggling with and something really fascinating. Actually, so Jim Ramo writes a paper in 2003 uh, about Japan and marriage, and he shows that highly, edu highly educated women are less likely to marry. 10 years later, Fukuda writes a paper in 2013, exactly 10 years later. He doesn't show, and this is an important point, um, he doesn't show the highly educated women are more likely to marry. What he shows is that high income women and women who have high income potential, earnings potential are more likely to marry. Now in Jim's 2003 article, like in the first paragraph, he says that education is a proxy for SES that can be used interchangeably for income. And so he's gonna analyze education. I don't know if that's true because <laughs> Uh, because and this is this gets to your point. And if I may share this one slide, I actually had this one last slide that I didn't talk about today, but this is something I've been really struggling with. It turns out that for us, so in our data, and I'll just show you here, um, income is positive for women, but education is negative, as I mentioned. We've been finding this again and again. So for example, Yushia and Zhao Yu has a paper in demography uh, where for women, the years of schooling was negative for marriage, but good jobs in their version in Chinese uh, society, the state sector was positive for marriage. This is in the same model, by the way. Um, and also, uh, again, as I mentioned this, but Jim's paper looks at education, but Fukuda doesn't look at education. So my question to you is, are we actually comparing apples to apples here? And I kept thinking about do we need to disaggregate SES such that education and income are not necessarily proxies for each other because we're finding this effect over, and we found it in our model, Yushia and Zhao Yu found it in their model for China. And if you put Jim Ramo and Setsuya Fukuda together, they're finding different things. I asked Jim about that specifically. Uh, and he said that actually, even the more recent data shows that highly educated women are more likely to marry. So he actually thinks that there's been a shift. What Fukuda argued is dual, the necessity for dual incomes. And this is to your point that the economy is fell, like, you know, you can't survive. So 
basically the woman has to work, thus women who work or highly educated, I guess, going to gym are more popular on the marriage market. I'm not sure if that's the case though. I, I feel like education and income are tapping at different things, different constructs, but you, what do you think? Yeah, I definitely think ed education and income are tapping at different things. And uh, I've always need to disaggregate those two in, in my yeah. study. And I think you're right, actually, uh, what we're seeing is probably more uh, income effect. And uh, in fact, um, the most recent um, data by um, Su Suya, Suya um, economist uh, in Japan, um, who has used similar Jap Japanese data, she found that uh, actually the, she didn't find a positive uh, effect of education to, to marriage either. So uh, to my, in my mind, I'm still wondering about that uh, too, but I think yeah. holding income constant education then uh, to me uh, indicate a more gender ideology and attitude. Yeah, uh, right, so, yeah. Right. so like the other, uh, the earlier comment today, they're not necessarily correlated. And what we think is education is a, an incredible investment in a woman's um, human capital. Right. And for women to be that educated and to then quit her job just because she got married is such a waste. And in fact, Lin Xiro, who was a recent graduate of our department in her dissertation, she showed that highly educated women who want to quit their jobs once they become mothers. So they get married, they're still working, once they become mothers, they want to quit their jobs. The woman's parents are like, don't quit your job. You know how much money we put into your, you invested in you? We'll take care of the grandchild. You got to keep working. So education for me is a proxy for investment in future careers. And thus, they don't want to give it up. Income, which is a separate thing, is like that can be the story that Fukuda wants to tell, which is basically that men find women with high income attractive because you got to pay the rent and one income is not enough these days. So I'm just trying to somehow put those together in my yeah, head, but yeah. I'm a hard time. But I think both are important. I think money right. is really important consideration sure. <laughs> in, the, uh, in the getting married or not. And then mm -hmm. when you're talking about parenthood, whether to have kids or not, and uh, you know whether they, uh, how much investment they want to have to, to put in in um, after they get married, after they have kids, that you know education uh, um, consideration then become also yeah, exactly. uh, more important. But at right, the right. marriage stage, I think income is very important. And Fakuta was saying is that there's higher unemployment rate for men than for women for, for yeah. quite a period of time for both right. uh, in Japan. And, and I don't know if that's true or not in, in Korea. So you Not can... in Korea, because okay. some of it is voluntary, but women's female labor force position is the lowest in the OECD for the amount of education women have. Yes, so, yes. So, yeah, but, um, so on your last point, I'll just be really quick, but Jim Ramo, as you know, probably Jim and Hyunjin Park, they've got the paper about marriage mismatch. Uh, looking at the structural argument and basically uh, because of hypergamy, hypergamy, there's no way, <laughs> there's no place to go up. <laughs> basically, it's really like there's no good men to marry because so many, because the education levels are so high. So we cite that paper, our strategy, our narrative strategy in our paper was to cite that paper, uh, but to say that that is the macro context, the marriage context, as you mentioned, the macro marriage context is important, but we're still identifying these sort of individual level, you know, reasoning, especially because it speaks to the interview, the interview data, which is more at that level. And people tend to think, so we do uh, know that that's an important part. We just don't do it, address it as well, empirically. Thank okay. you. Okay. So uh, I would like to let uh, Cheng Cheng get a chance to ask question. And I understand that you're working on this kind of topic too, right? Cheng, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I understand we're almost running out of time, so I will be quick. Uh, if that, or are we out? That's okay. Out? Keep okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in terms of framing, I think the focus on gender symmetry and parental wealth are really good, important contributions. Um, I agree that economic contribution expected for men and women, if per Sweeney's article would be converging in the Western literature, but they are still very different um, in Korea and in China as well. So I think that is good contribution. Um, 
also agree with you in terms of parental resources. There's a lot of work on parental resources affecting home ownership, affecting transmission of associated inequality, but not so much in terms of marriage per se. Um, there's some work on matching on parental backgrounds, but that's different um, compared to entry to marriage and et cetera. Um, but I want to say a bit more about your, the, at the very last, I wonder about the only child situation. Um, so, there, uh, so the question I have is whether there is selection into only child in Korea, because in China, there's one child policy, but uh, I wonder if the parents who choose to have only one kid are systematically different from parents who don't. Um, but that's a technical issue. Um, in terms of um, substantive interpretation of um, only child, so um, I don't know if that's the case in Korea, but um, in China, there's a lot of literature on how parents of only, with only one daughter are more likely to contribute to the purchase of the marital home um, because one, they only have this one child and even though she's a daughter, they still want mm -hmm. to contribute to her marriage. Um, two is that by contributing to her marriage, they hope this will give her more power um, in the new in the extended family, uh, in her struggle with her parents-in-law, et cetera. So uh, there's an incentive of parents of only daughters to contribute to the purchase of new marital home. Um, um, on the other hand, um, parents who of only daughters also want to contribute to the purchase of um, the marital home is because they wanted to purchase filial piety in the sense that if they buy the house for the new couple, then the new couple will be more devoted to elderly care of them, yeah. if that yeah. makes sense. So, um, so, there, so there's some tension between parent, husband's parents and wife's parents in the purchase of the new marital home, especially when both the husband and wife are only child of their respective families. Um, so I, so, so the takeaway from that is probably we'll find more gender symmetry when there are multiple siblings, but the gender symmetry may not be as apparent if there are, if there are both only children. So there may be interaction between parental mm -hmm. wealth and only child. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's the case in Korea, but, I, but based on the literature in China, I think that might be the case. Um, and finally, in terms of um, the chance of getting married uh, or staying single, it, I think it's hard. It, there may be two directions of the effects might be going on. One is for daughters with high parental wealth, it's harder for them to find a good match, especially when they're the only daughter of the family, because they have so much to inherit from their parents, and their parents also want to make sure that their wealth are well taken care of after, after they move on. So um, it may be harder for them to find a good match of someone who's also having a lot of parental wealth and the only son of their natal family. Um, but that said, these daughters with a lot of wealth to inherit and are the only daughters of their parents are really popular on the marriage market because they can off they can contribute a lot in the purchase of the marital home. Right. But so it really so so you can see the forces going in different directions. So you might end up with a null coefficient just because of all these forces going on. But um, I yeah, if you can address the only child selection issue, then I think there's a lot of story to tell on the only child part if you want to move forward. But otherwise, um, selection might be an issue in Korea. Right. Um, so thank you for that. Um, the technical selection issue is pretty easy to find out. You can just do a run across tab between parental wealth and number of children and see if, you know, parents are richer with less kids. You know what I mean? Um, Two competing though trends that I can see. One, if you're on the one hand, if you're only child, you have all of your parents' resources to inherit, thus you have more greater proportional parental wealth. But on the other hand, there's a bunch of literature that shows that richer parents have more kids because they can afford it. The, the dominant argument is that uh, the reason why Koreans don't have more kids is they can't afford to raise them. So that's also going in different directions. The second point about, um, I think, so this is what I want to ask you all about Singapore and about China and about Taiwan. In Korea, Tian Li, you can tell me if I'm uh, overstepping my grounds, but you can tell me, but in Korea, the daughter's parents won't buy the house, even if they could. 
the, the son's family will lose face because the marriage culture for the men's family to buy the house and for the woman's family to furnish the house, that cultural, um, there's actually a whole history behind this, which my second, the second author on the paper, Chio, in her dissertation she wrote about, it's actually was codified in a government document that was kind of referencing what you should do when you marry in the 1980s. And that becomes the value that, you know, kind of like takes hold. So in Korean society, if, I mean, obviously I'm sure it does happen in reality. Like, you know, the men's family can't afford the house so the woman's family who's rich um, probably, but because of hypergamy, both on the family side, at the family level, I don't know how many rich women are marrying. Well, actually that's not true. It's status exchange. So doctors, and like poor doctors, ma poor male doctors and lawyers are marrying daughters of rich families because they bring the status the, the guy and they bring the wealth the woman brings the wealth and then the you know the woman's family sets them up with a clinic or, or you know a practice there, there's that but generally speaking on the aggregate that wouldn't happen in korean society because of this very very strict and i don't know if that's true for china and taiwan or even singapore i don't i can't imagine it i would guess not so the 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 scenario that you described i don't see that really happening in the korean context at least on the surface, I'm sure in reality it's a lot more messier, but yeah, does that make sense? I don't know if that makes sense. Does, so let me ask you, so let me ask you all a question. Let me ask a question. Let me, in Singapore, I have a couple of questions about Singapore um, because I wasn't, I wasn't studying this stuff when I was there. So I don't, you know, I was studying protests. So I was interested in that part. Anyway, um, in Singapore, when a woman, Singaporean woman marries, are they expected to quit their jobs? Do they feel pressure, social pressure, for either from their husbands or the families or society to one, quit their jobs? Two, when Singaporean women have children within the context of marriage, do they quit their jobs then? Is there an M curve like in Japan and in Korea? And then the other question to Cheng Cheng's point is um, who buys the house? How does housing work? I know Singaporean housing is crazy. I know there's the HDBs and stuff and I get that, but you know what I mean? It's still expensive. So what, like, is there a gendered marriage cultural sort of trend? I'm just trying to understand. So I think two people that could help you answer this question here is Jean and maybe Pauline. I think Pauline would be a better person. Okay, Pauline, do you want to chime in? Pauline? <laughs> maybe she's not there. Oh, she's there, okay. Um, I, I think if I am um, if I am not wrong, um, I I believe there was uh, some studies that's unpublished. Uh, a lot of research in a lot of uh, surveys done in Singapore are uh, actually published in newspapers, but uh, somehow don't make it to academic research. And I think that um, maybe the piece that I've seen that is most closely related is uh, is an unpublished survey done by. Um, a voluntary welfare organization, that's what we call them. And they look at uh, indeed um, um, a question that's very similar to what's being asked, um, look at whether that's a difference. And I think that, um, I think that there was, uh, I, I don't, I, I'm sorry, I, I really can't remember it uh, very well anymore because it's been a while. But I think that in fact, they were, there was some evidence that, um, um, that, that, um, that there was some gender difference. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry that the, the, the response is so vague. Um, but, yeah. Did Jane, okay. you want to say, but you know, the government pay, play a big role in uh, housing, right? In subsidy. And you know, the younger you are, the more uh, uh, subsidy you get. And therefore I think make housing much more affordable, right? So yes, the housing, right. housing scene is really different in Singapore. The young couples are all, you know, they want to get their uh, public housing flat. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so if, if their earning actually goes up to a certain level, uh, they would be disqualified. And uh, in this process, parents' wealth is not uh, very much a consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, but the very there... rich um... ones go and get condos and maybe that's, that set of people. So then, is it a couple though? Uh, so is it, or is there expectation that the, the male will find, try to get the flat, whether it's HDB or not, it's a couple doing it together. Yeah, yeah. and it's a household income. It's not gender like it is in Korea. It's not It's gender. household income, yeah. 
But if you're going on the private market, then uh, maybe parents, uh, you know, wealth becomes a factor and uh, men or women's income becomes a factor. There's it's still quite a gendered society, but the housing market is uh, qu quite different from, from China and Korea. And, and another thing you ask is about the uh, working status. In mm -hmm. Singapore, it's very big on, uh, you know, getting women to work. Uh, right. Women in labor market is very important for Singapore's uh, economy. Mm -hmm. And you don't see a big drop in uh, labor market uh, after marriage, but you do see a bigger drop after one gets uh, have, have a child. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's a very uh, strange situation. I, up till now, I, I don't understand why, is that uh, um, after the employment rates drop, uh, after first or second uh, child, um, you don't see that rate, employment rate come up again, the M, M okay. shape. Uh, in Singapore, and, and many of that uh, women stay out of labor market for quite mm -hmm. a while uh, for some reason, and that may have to do with you know the labor competitive market. schooling education of uh, children in, in, of children in Singapore, and there's a test of uh, you mm -hmm. know after primary school there's a test for uh, the next level mm -hmm. of schooling. Yeah, right. A lot, a lot of the parents, mothers in particular, are quite nervous about that, and they spend a lot of time uh, at home. But uh, in general, there's no uh, yeah. strong expectation for women to drop out of the labor market. Uh, so one, yeah. One thing that I thought about in Singapore, having lived there, um, they've got a pretty incredibly developed and affordable nanny industry. I remember all the living nannies and, you know, people coming from Indonesia, other parts. Korea doesn't have that. I mean, they do to some degree, obviously, but like not like affordable in terms of proportion to household income, monthly income. So I always yeah. thought that that might have been one factor that allowed Singaporean women to stay. Even if they have children, their children can be taken care of. Um, that that was affordable. the original purpose to, mm -hmm. to, to, to okay. allow women to stay in the labor market market but it's good to know that only one third of the young couples have a domestic helper not everyone has it so again we're talking about a very different social economic status uh, you know those obviously with high income and high education are able to do that but not everyone can do that okay. i um, just that wanted to chime in on Sorry. I mean, the role of family is also very important, right? The government encourage uh, couples to live close to their parents uh, for, you know, all sorts of support, right? So, so is that gender too? Or is it like live close to the men's family, the guy's family, or it doesn't matter? Because uh, in I'm traditional not... Korean culture, you live close to the, it's like the woman is literally like married off to the men's, you know what I mean? Like uh, even 20 years ago, they were stricken off their own family registry and put on their men's, uh, you know, on their husband's family registry, whereas the son stayed. So it was like literally legally temporary members of the family, daughters were. Mm -hmm. But in Singapore, you don't have that gendered. I, I don't I don't believe so, right? I think it's more flexible. Well, Pauline can say oh. more. <laughs> uh, yeah, I... Um... I think that because your research is talking about parental wealth, uh, it's probably worth uh, just mentioning that um, to some extent, actually, your qualifications for BTO might be affected by uh, parental wealth in that if you, first of all, if you, um, if you have any ownership and pe some people who are very wealthy can actually bequeath property on the, on the children. If you, if you actually get a BTO, uh, it you know, it, uh, diminishes your ability to acquire uh, property later. So it does affect uh, people's uh, propensity to enter that uh, the property market. Uh, and, and actually another um, thing is that um, in Singapore, people are paid to live close to their parents. So your question about gender is not really so much yeah. about, yeah, uh, you're subsidized. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're subsidized to live close. The government pays. Within two kilometers. Yeah. I think now it's four kilometers. Um, but yeah. basically, 
it, it may be a big it may be a big advantage um, to live near one of the parents who is it doesn't really matter who yeah. whether it's the wife or the husband's parents, mm -hmm. but rather who lives near to a, like a core district. Right. You know, in, in a more favorable district. Because um, right. then you get subsidy for living in an expensive, mature district, which would otherwise be expensive. Um, so that's a non-gendered uh, part of it uh, yeah. that would be more based on who, whose parents are better located. Right. So parental status or position or wealth or whatever that allowed them to buy their own home does affect children's housing decision making because they're going to try to move closer to the parent that's in a nice neighborhood. Yeah, and if let's say their parents are really wealthy and they expect to inherit uh, the house, they will have to pay a huge tax if they were to acquire the property because of um, something called a stamp duty uh, for housing is huge. Like um, oh. we, I believe about 15% uh, of the value. 15? One five, yes. So if it's worth 1 million, you're paying $150,000. And houses <laughs> in Singapore go for much more. So it's That's funny low, because, relatively speaking. Yeah, okay. That's what Paul's going to say. In America, oh, okay, right. the inheritance tax is like 50%. Like you get, like, right, you right. Know, okay. your parents left you $10, you give five of it to the government. Like, exactly. You know, the really rich people. So, so I think well, in general, Singapore is less gendered than South Korea. In so many think, aspects, less so gendered. My, Theory and Cheng Cheng, you can tell me. I think I think I think I think South Korea is more gendered than even China, like yes. mainland. China. Oh, um, Don't I think know like Mar I mean, <laughs> yeah. So even in China, you don't have the kind of submissive uh, to the mother-in-law, the husband's mom uh, kind of culture you do in Korea. Like Korea yeah. is so traditional in that sense, which is really driving a lot of women's behaviors for both family and work. I even know. more than that's, Japan, I feel like. That's why I'm intrigued about your uh, grandmother, mother-in-law uh, culture, which is, I think, is unique to Korea, actually. <laughs> so you may want to say a little bit more about it. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, the side note, but historically, during the Joseon period, the Joseon dynasty from 13-something to 18, late 1800s, when, when Chinese Confucianism was evolving and um, becoming more, quote-unquote, progressive, the Confucian scholars, the Neo-Confucian scholars in South Korea thought they were keeping the original Chinese Confucianism because even the mainland scholars have strayed. You know what I mean? So there was this idea that Korea was maintaining the traditional Chinese Confucian culture way more conservatively. And that sort of carries on yeah. to, yeah. you know, in a weird way that sort of like makes sense to what, what we're seeing even now. Yeah, I think um, so. But Paul, I, I think that, you, you know, um, with regard to whether it's more gender in Korea or China, I think one element is that in Korea, people are less likely to live with their, near to their parents compared to uh, Taiwan or China, right? Uh, isn't there yeah. a, a big trend towards young people moving far away um, so, to cities away? Uh, so originally, yes, the macro was from moving from the countryside where the parents were and, and young people moving to the cities. But now it's pretty, even you have a lot of old people in the cities too, because that was in the 1960s and 70s. Mm -hmm. So those people are now the parents, right? The elderly parents, the people mm -hmm. that move in the cities. The trend that I'm hearing now is the common anecdotal thing is that a lot of um, parents, a lot of people won't co-reside, but they'll live in the same apartment complex. It's just the way that the housing structure works physically, architecturally, so that you have these huge buildings that are part of uh, one complex. You might not live in the same building, you might live in the building over, but like, you know, you can walk to their house. So when we were doing, oh, so Jean, this, when we're doing our family goal survey, one of the things we're talking about was co residing with parents. And then the Italians were like, well, do you live in the same house or a different village? And then the Koreans were like, do you, no, it's about living in like the next building over. And so we're trying to, it's such a weird, a different thing in Korea in terms of co -resign. So there is a new culture of living close to them. And partly a lot of that has to do with free labor for grandchildren, like, you know, grandparents, want, you know, watching the grandkids kind of thing. Um, but the older story of moving away, that was really the generation above in the 60s and 70s, um, and not so much now, I think. The, probably more like Singapore than it is now. Can I add um, more? Yeah, please. So let me intervene for a second. So I know we go over time, but the conversation is quite interesting. Uh, so for those of you who join us today and have to leave, please feel free to do so. 
and we'll leave, you know, we'll just continue the conversation. Uh, so thank you. And uh, Jiyeon, please ask questions. Yeah, um, actually, I, re I read um, many articles and um, I know my friend's stories. And it's a very anecdotal, but anyway, and yeah. Actually, in Korea, uh, when, um, how can I put it? Uh, if wife should work because of the economic um, situation of the households, and they need to, they need someone to provide the care give, uh, caregiving to their child, then that family, um, usually they wanted to um, live close to their wife's family. You know right. what I mean? But if the wife wanted to work because of their career, not because of the uh, financial issue in the family, in the household, then, um, in oh, sorry, the opposite, opposite one, sorry, sorry. Okay, I'll, let me see. Because of the gender ideology, uh, the caring the child is a um, responsibility of, of female, the wife. So even though it is um, the woman, the female wanted to work because of their career, then because the care, child care giving is a female female responsibility, so they uh, ask the help uh, from their mother, the wife's mother. But, right. um, but wives need to work because of the financial issues of the family. Then, you know, the financial responsibility actually is originally um, uh, the burden, the, the burden of the male. Then, uh, child caregiving work is for is of the <laughs> duty of the um I mean the male's mother male male side. So I read the kind of interesting articles. So I think if we consider gender ideology, then we can um interpret many phenomena in Korea about the family issues. I think so. Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to add this because it is. Uh, it is the empirical results of the empirical study, and um, I learned a lot of uh, stories from my friends or my colleagues. So, yeah, I think it could be uh, one of the interpretation about the, the housing or the marriage or that kind of things. Yeah. <laughs> so think about the psychology of what Tian just said. This blows me away. In Korean society, the gender norms for men to be the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. And the women to take care of the kid is so mm -hmm. strong. So strong. That yeah. if you can't do it, those needs, those psychological needs get transferred up to their parents. Mm -hmm. So if the, if, the, if the husband can't make enough money mm -hmm. uh, and then the wife is forced to work, then the husband's parents feel so bad because their, husband, their son sucks, is not doing his job. So they're willing to step in to watch, watch the kid because they feel bad because the responsibility falls on the husband's family. And if not the husband, then it gets transferred up to the parents. On the wife's though, if, if they have money and, and the woman just wants to work because of her career, then, and they have a child, their husband might feel the pressure, give the wife pressure. Like you're, not, you're, gonna, you're a bad mom if you work, you can't outsource childcare, all that you know, pressure that the husband's family might give, but she's not doing it for the money, she's doing it for her own career. Then the wife's parents will step in and say, no, keep working. This is what Inshiro's dissertation shows. Then the wife's family will step in and say, no, keep working. So it's, I mean, it blows my mind that the gender culture is so rigid that if the husband and wife can't fulfill their roles, those needs get transferred up to the parents, at least in the in the in, in the case of uh, grandchild care. That's what I'm hearing from what Tian just said. So that's yeah. incredible. And that kind of um, gendered, kind, I, I don't know how to put it. The atmosphere, <laughs> the atmosphere makes that uh, makes a uh, kind of norm that uh, the buying a house is a responsibility of the male, not for the female. Yeah, female. I, I think, yeah. Because, and it's a, it's a yeah. sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so because financial responsibility is a burden of the male, as you can right. see in your results of the qualitative study, but female, I don't think female mentioned about their uh, burden of the uh, financial contribution to their household or marriage, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's remarkable to me that in zero interviews that we did with female 
they mm-hmm. never mentioned totally the financial never. responsibility of their family, like their own finance. They never mentioned it. Mm-hmm. Every single, I mean, I got to count, but almost every single friend remember, there's just constant theme of the, from the guys. That was the biggest thing. It's just never mentioned. And, and if, and if, uh, um, the, if the husband, if the couple does bad, like they don't have a home and they have to rent and they're in a bad neighborhood, then the husband's parents feel bad. Like they feel like they didn't, do their job of securing their sons. You know what I mean? Like that's the kind of culture where I think is why we're finding these empirical results, which I don't know if it's going to be replicated in a place like China. I know, Cheng, I know you're working on housing, um, parental supporting housing for their children. I don't know if it's going to, you know what I mean? It's going to have that gendered element to it. Like it is in Korea. I don't know. I mean, that's an empirical question, but. Yeah, I, it, it, I think the literature is moving. So, so, it, it, so the tradition was still that the men supposed to buy the house and women were likely to, the women's family were likely to decorate. But there's a lot of newer common papers talking about urban scenarios where um, parents are, of daughters are also contributing to the purchase because one, housing price is super high and, and it's a lot of burden on just men's family and two, uh, vice versa family want to have a say in this family decision so yeah and it it is an empirical question i think it varies depending on region to region and um, specific populations is your study coming along on that your paper on that are are you are you i I remember you were telling me you're working on that topic on housing specific yeah uh I don't know where that is in the review process. I think it's somewhere in there. Okay. It's a, well, yeah, I, 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 it's a co-author work with uh, Jaggi and we um, Right, right. Yeah, but I, we didn't look at um, both sides, I think. I can't remember exactly, but there's a lot of piece in that uh, trying to look at factors contributing to housing. Um, but, but I can... I, I can follow up with you on that. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I can wait. I just, I remember we had yeah. talked about that earlier. Uh, I was just curious what you were going to find. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, you want to say anything else? <laughs> I think, interestingly, even, you know, we are about half an hour over time. There's still at least more than half of people are still staying. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I used to think, you know, Japan is uh, hopeless in adapting to this changing uh, woman's role. Um, but now I am more and more convinced that Korea is going to surpass that reputation <laughs> over yeah. Japan. So I don't know how you're going to solve this problem. <laughs> I mean, you're going to see basically the never married uh, proportion keep going up because they're not going to solve it. And women are, you know, you know, it's not just me, but other people are saying that they're opting out. They'd rather opt out. I mean, there's a radical 4B movement, which is like give up marriage, give up sex, give up children, like shave your head. Like, I mean, it's like it's like radicalizing. It's so bad, you know. So maybe it's not so know. bad. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Relatively well, push supported. push uh, to the extreme. Hopefully, things would change. You know, in terms of the policy, they have now provided the world's most generous maternity leave and paternity leave. But, you know, 5% of the people are, (laughs) the take up rate is so low that uh, that is obviously not helping. But, you know, a hard stand on uh, tackling the gender inequality, both at home and uh, at the labor market, that's the hard part. And I I hope that's going to we're going to start seeing that uh, more serious effort in all the Asian countries, including Singapore, actually. <laughs> yeah, I learned a lot today. Thank you. <laughs> from you guys. Thanks so uh, much, Paul, and everyone who uh, joined and, you know, contribute to this very lively discussion. I hope you this is useful for you to help, uh, you know, pushing your paper out. I think it's a very interesting and important work. And hopefully once you finish, you know, or your book coming out, you should come back and share it with us again. Anytime. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good to see you all.